Welcome back to another GTN Coaches Corner. This week, I'm joined by none other than Olaf, the sports scientist and coach for the Norwegian triathlon team. Thank you for joining us today, Olaf. Thank you for having me. Right, we are going to be talking about fitness tests today. We've got off-season breaks and training, sticking to zones in training, and lactate testing. Are you ready for this, Olaf? All right, let's get into this then. So starting with the fitness tests, things like FTP tests, do you prescribe them? Are they the sort of things that the, the Norwegian team are doing? I suspect not. What's your thoughts on them? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, th I think uh, we use it, I, like not the, let's say how FTP testings very often are perceived or misperceived today. No, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, I can do what we would call rather critical power testing. Right. But the difference between doing a 20 minute test and you, sub you subtract, for example, a 5% value, which not necessarily is not, is not a bad thing, but you have to look at it, what kind of context you are in. What I do normally rather is that I use different kind of bespoke protocol depending on what I want to figure out with the athletes. Okay, and that, so it's interesting. So obviously the critical power test is, uh, there's a few sort of tests within one, right? So you get like that power curve. As an athlete, you know, age group athlete just doing 70.3s or iron distance races, is that a good test for them or does an FTP test, you know, good old 20 minute FTP test actually give them all that they provide? I would say that doing a critical power test is probably more accurate because you get more information from it. And what I mean by that is that when you are training, uh, you will do most probably low intensity training, you will do medium intensity training, you're gonna do high intensity training. And when you do all these kind of different trainings and, and you are uh, doing a critical power test, which typically consists of, let's say, three different all out uh, 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 intervals, yeah. then uh, you get an idea actually of the balance between, let's say your short duration power and your long duration powers, or let's say medium duration powers. And typically for many athletes which are uh, very determined, they like to push themselves really hard on the training. And very often we do see that that typically skews the curves toward a more vertical curve than necessarily a horizontal curve. And if you think of it just very practically, what you really want to excel in when you're an Ironman athlete, for example, is the longer duration. And that means at some point you need to make a trade-off where you might have to actually accept the fact that you need to not maybe even decrease a little bit in the, let's say, the, the shorter, really shorter durations and letting actually the, 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 the more medium duration power starts to come up a little yeah. bit. Otherwise, they might conflict because uh, doing any kinds of intervals will require some recovery. And if you do like a lot of short interval all the time and then you go into uh, what's, let's say, more longer duration intervals and you are more fatigued, you, it's more difficult to really have development there. So. That's why I like to do, uh, I'm more inclined towards critical power testing or critical pace velocity testing than like a pure less 20 minute flat out because that only gives you an insight in whether the 20 minute power increased or decreased or didn't change. Brilliant, yeah. great answer. Okay, uh, off season. So here I'm referring to kind of, you know, let's take Gustav and Christian, for example, they get to the end of the season, their last race. What does the protocol or the plan then look like for the next few months and the immediate, you know, the, the few weeks after that final race of the season? Well, I think uh, the main difference between uh, off season and, uh, and norm, uh, let's say race season or normal season is that it's less structured training, meaning that they do more the training they would like to do. So I think it was last year or two years ago, for example, they had off season, they were went out for 300 kilometer rides and all this kind of thing. So it gives a little bit of an idea of where their motivation is uh, during yeah. the off season. And, and uh, in my, my perspective, I think that's just healthy as well, right? Absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah. For such a large portion of the year, it's so structured. Yeah. And yeah, okay, cool. Um, zones, should we stick to them religiously? So for example, you're out on an easy run, you start seeing your heart rate drift into zone three. Should you bring that heart rate down? Should you start walking up the hills to make sure it stays in zone two and things like this? What would you suggest? I would always look at it in the context of what you are, what's the purpose with the workout. So if it's like a very important workout, which has the goal of preparing you for a race or whether it's close to a race or far away from a race, I would rather allow for somebody to stick more to the target 
in and, and not care so much about heart rate and these kind of things for that kind of workout. While if it's another workout that is more like a support workout for a workout that is going to prepare you, then I would maybe think that, okay, what is the consequence if I really push through on this workout now? leading into the next work, which I know is important for you. And if you then think, it, okay, if I push through here now, I'm uncertain. This might actually become a little bit so that I'm too, too fatigued into the important workout. I would ease off and just say, don't care about the zones. So zones, I would say, I'm not, I don't care too much about. I would rather stick more with what's the purpose of the workout and evaluate it in the context of whether it's in, in the workout where it's important to push through or actually He's, okay. he's off instead, yeah. So it's like, again, a healthy balance yeah. with that. Okay, exactly. nice. Yeah. Um, right, lactate testing. Right, of course, we've seen you guys do <laughs> lots of lactate testing. Um, so that in mind, should age group amateur athletes be, do be doing lactate testing as we've seen Christian Gustav doing? I think the, the pitfall with lactate is that there is a lot of possibilities to do errors there. All the way from basically that you are getting contaminated samples and you are making uh, and you don't actually realize it because there can be like a just an offset in the numbers that you get on your lactate meter and if you re uh, and the problem is that if if you're then using that to inform yourself what to do next in that workout that might lead to worse wrestle from that workout think of it another way if you have a power meter and you're guiding your training based on the power meter and suddenly there is something happening to your power meter and it, the numbers are starting to get skewed a little bit too high or something like this, and you just follow this uh, mindlessly, yeah. you're gonna blow up unless you take that. Into so I think that with all numbers, all kind of testing, it's important, it's important to, to one, understand why you're doing it, what, what are you trying try to get from it? And lactate is also far more complex just because of the way that it works. You're measuring in something that happens in the blood, there are kinetics involved and all these kind of things that which makes it even more difficult to, uh, to interpret it. But if you really decide that this is, this is something that uh, you want to invest time in and understand, there's absolutely a value to it. Yeah, but then as you say, it's understanding yeah. also what to do with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and again, with the athletes, how do you go about adapting their training? Is there anything that you look for on a daily basis? Maybe it's metrics, HRV, anything like that that you go, right, Gustav, we need to adapt today's training or the next few days training. Um, is that something you do? Yeah, but actually one I do much more important for me is actually the, so we have all these uh, all these metrics today like HRV, uh, but I very seldom use them, or I would I can't remember last time I used the metric to determine whether we make an adjustment or not, because in the end it comes down to I, I rather sit with my athletes and talk with them what's the feeling how do you feel and these kind of things, and then the metrics would be supportive or trying to bring that more into an objective context rather. So, uh, because there's still, there's a lot we can measure today, but there are even more we can't measure. So that means that all the instruments is more uh, something we use to calibrate the feeling, uh, but the feeling is what in the end that matters, whether we, what, what guides the, the decisions. That's really refreshing to hear, because yeah, I think a lot of people are going towards you know focusing on the numbers the watch what it's saying yeah. and actually yeah. in the day it's speak with the athlete what are you actually feeling being in tune with the body and that should be there to support it and maybe help okay great and then finally can an athlete self-coach themselves i think some i think some athletes can do that some athletes but i think it's always good i think always is good to discuss the training and decisions and other uh, and other things with somebody, either it's an advisor or it's a coach or something like this, for sure. And I do think that ultimately, if you really want to reach the highest level, 
then you have to more think of that you need to have a team around you. In the same way that you can't imagine to become the fastest Formula One driver uh, on the grid uh, if you're going to do all the mechanics, you're going to do all the design, all the analysis and all these kind of things because you need a team around you. Because if you're a team, then that means that there are somebody that can dig deeper into different details and look at how you can put it together and the athlete can start to focus more on executing and giving good feedback. Interesting, yeah, very good. I, I could honestly sit here and talk to you all day about uh, training and everything. So thanks ever so much. Um, if you've enjoyed today's video, please do give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Please do get involved in the comment section down below. And don't forget to subscribe. Cheers, I love.